right, we want to welcome you guys back to the Make or Break show. We're hanging out with the one and only Brad Rodriguez from Fix This, Build That. Calling in, you're in Franklin, Tennessee, right? Is that where you're at? I am. Yeah, just south of Nashville. Good stuff. Well, we're excited to have you on and to chat with you. So welcome. Thank you, man. Glad to be here. Well, uh, I wanted to kind of get into your story as a woodworker, maker, content creator. I know you've done a bunch of different things. When um, you were growing up, did I see Boy Scouts was like a big part? Was that right? Were you an yeah. Eagle? Are you an Eagle Scout? Is that right? I am an Eagle Scout. I'm glad you I'm glad you changed that up because you never <laughs> stopped being an Eagle Scout. I right? know. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I've had some friends that are Eagle Scouts. You don't yeah, you don't have to say Boy you Scouts. Say, were you? Yeah. You say, yeah. So I was in Scouts uh growing up and I started, you know, basically in Cub Scouts and then went all the way through uh to Eagle Scouts. So yeah, that was a huge part of of my life early on. And I think it was cool because, you know, trying to tying into the story um of just my background. My my dad wasn't a real handy guy. He was kind of working all the time. Um, and so most of the stuff that I learned, like the outdoorsy and things like that, was all through scouts. And yeah. so it wasn't like, you know, necessarily building, but at the same time, you know, just doing Pinewood Derby and Rain Gutter Regatta and just, you know, tying knots and building campfires and and setting up tents and just doing that stuff. I think that there's there's an innate skill that you get, right, by doing all those things that's just like how to how to build, how to how to just take things and make something else. And I think that that translates a lot. So I think that actually is a pretty big uh, reason behind, you know, me wanting to to get into making and, and kind of creating. Yeah, yeah. Was there like a badge that really sticks out that you like remember, like having a work to earn? Um, the, now I always remember that it, the ones that I liked the most were like, uh, kind of the, the sports one. So oh, like cool. when I said not sports necessarily, but like canoeing, uh, archery. And so I, you know, I, it, it's so long ago, man. I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember yeah. any of the badges that were really hard, but I don't know, just like whenever we would go to camp, uh, like I would always be like, all right, sweet. Like where's the water and like, where's the archery range? Cause that's, that's what I loved doing there. And then obviously making fires, like every boy scout likes to make fires. Cause it's just like, you got an excuse to, you know, just nuke stuff. So why not? <laughs> At what uh, what point did you kind of decide engineering was going to be the route for you? Because you went to UT, University of Tennessee, Tennessee for mechanical. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Mechanical engineering. Um, you know, I don't I don't know. It was kind of you know when I look back and think about it, um, it was just like one of those evolutions where I was really good at math and sciences, and and you know, so it's like okay, you're going to be an engineer. It was just kind of this like odd thing. Like my, my dad's not an engineer. And, like we have no engineering. That's actually not true. My my um my mother's um stepfather was actually he worked for NASA. Oh cool. <laughs> but but he wasn't uh he wasn't like a huge influence on me. He was actually a woodworker too, but he was down in Florida. We were in Tennessee, so we didn't get to see him that much. Um but yeah, it was just like, okay, you're good at math and uh you're good at science. So like what do you want to do? And you know, back then the job market was really strong, right? So I graduated high school in 95 and you know stuff was was pretty well booming back then uh and and as i got into college it was like okay engineering and engineering was a big thing going on right then and lots of um lots of, a great job market i guess and so it was like okay well i could go do that or i could go do you know some like i didn't want to go be like a, a doctor or anything like that so i thought it was cool i, I liked working my hands. I was like, yeah, I want to go design stuff. That'd be really cool. And then yeah. I realized later on that that's not at all what those, a lot of those people do. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was exactly the way I did, uh, aerospace engineering at Georgia tech. And so I was like, I want to go in, I want to build planes and all that kind of stuff. And then like you start working you're like, Oh, it's all like sitting in front of a computer and yes. run tests and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, I want, yeah. I want to build. Something. And it's like, yeah, well, they're like, yeah, you can build planes and it's like, OK, it's cool. But then like your job is actually modeling like a bracket. Yeah. 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 <laughs> You know, so it's like, you don't, you're not like putting together the airplane, you know, and, and, uh, we were, we were just talking before we started recording about, uh, GE aircraft, which is, which is awesome. It's just where I work coming straight out of college. But, uh, so that was actually really cool because you get to get to see the entire engine there and see them assemble it. But, you know, that was more of just being out there and seeing it. So the actual day to day of doing the engineering work and doing like the vibrational analysis and, and all the nitty gritty yeah. behind the scenes stuff like that just wasn't for me. So I kind of, I moved from that into operations and then into business. Uh, I got my master's in business and then I kind of, you know, just got out of engineering altogether. Yeah. Yeah. So was, were you 
making at all? Like, were you using your hands, whether it's in college or like, when did the kind of the woodworking piece kind of re-enter your story or, or first enter your story? I remember, um, I was thinking about this the other day. I remember when I was in college, we had a design project and it was, uh, we had to like, we were partnering with, um, I want to say it was Lexmark, the old, I don't even know, they used to around, <laughs> they used to make inkjet printers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they had, we, the job was to, they had these little like circular discs that um, went in the printers and it would basically, um, you know, it was like a match fit piece that would work for the toner cartridges or something like that. And so uh, the idea was you had to take this piece and it had different slots in it and you had to design a machine that would look at it and basically be like image recognition. So today we would just take a picture of it, you know, but yeah. back then <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't that advanced. So anyway, we had to make this uh, piece using like IR sensors and all this crazy stuff. But uh, point of the story being that as we started making it, we started making the housing out of this like ABS plastic. And I remember I was like using the drill press and we we're like drilling out some holes. And then I was just like, okay, whatever. And I'm like drilling down and it catches on it. And then the piece starts like flipping and spinning <laughs> around. I'm like, oh, geez. So, so I was not like a uh, great maker in college by any stretch of <laughs> imagination. I almost, you know, killed myself with a piece of ABS plastic trying to drill a hole through it. So it was more um, outside of college, after college, uh, about 2001, um, 2002, when, when I really started getting into it and I bought a house. I bought an old fixer upper. Uh, it wasn't even really a fixer upper. It was just an old house. Yeah. It was built in 1905. Oh, wow. Uh, lived in Cincinnati at the time. And then I started doing like the home DIY stuff. So I started uh, messing around doing repairs and, and just, you know, flooring and cabinets and that kind of stuff. And that that spurred it on. And then, you know, just watching. I know this is a lot of people talking about this. I was, I was listening to Johnny. He's a buddy of mine. Um, I know he was on earlier, yeah. but uh, but New Yankee Workshop and, and Ask This Old House. Those yeah. are huge influences on me. Uh, what about... Or the fine we're working, I guess the, the furniture piece, I mean, you're doing DIY, um, renovating all that kind of stuff. When did more of the refined, like woodworking kind of get yeah. into your story? That was, um, that was probably around, I want to say it was around maybe 2003, 2005. So, um, I guess it would be 2003 because we got married in 2005. So when I met, uh, when I met my wife when we were dating at the time, she was teaching at a high school and they actually had, which is amazing because it's not around here. They had a wood shop at the high school. Oh, still, cool. And they ha offered night classes, yeah. which was really cool. So my, um, my buddy, who is now my brother-in-law, uh, he actually, he's married to my wife's sister. And um, so at the time, that's kind of how I met my wife was through him. Uh, he and I were like, hey, man, we like this. This looks sweet. Let's go do this woodworking thing uh, because we had been getting some things. I actually took a an introductory class at a woodcraft and I okay. made a little serving tray and that was cool. And it kind of piqued my interest. So then that's what it was. It was about, you know, 2000. I think it was about 2003. Uh, we started doing that and it was it was really cool because it was like a whole semester. Um, so it was like, I don't know, three months or so. And I got to go in there and I made uh, like a, a legit like then my first project. I did the serving tray. Then like very next project was like a uh, mission style as arts and craft mission style coffee table out of oh, white wow. oak. Yeah. It was like a ton, I was like all mortise and tenon joinery. Yeah. So I like went from straight in. To, yeah. Yeah. I went from zero to 100. And I don't know if I've ever cut a mortise or tenon since then. But uh, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, because that's when I got the taste of it. <laughs> yeah, because like uh, your I guess your most recent video, uh, the modern is it the end table? Is that the walnut yep. end table? Uh, and yep. I was like, oh, this is kind of the first like more like hardwood furniture piece, at least that I remember you putting out. Uh, but that's that's funny. Uh, for smart more Yeah, uh, yeah. It's the way. So the way I kind of and a lot of people ask me that. Um, because I think when people watch my videos and they see stuff, they're like, oh yeah, he's like a beginner, you know, doing DIY stuff. But then, like, if you step back and look at the tools I have, you're probably like, yeah. okay, this guy's, you know, able to do yeah. or has been doing it for a while or, or has better tools. But um, so the stuff that I make a lot for the channel is really focused around my mission and goal for the channel, which is to inspire new people to start woodworking. Yeah. And so I want to make it really attainable. So I'm more from the beginner, I'd say, up to kind of the, you know, intermediate to advanced intermediate. Uh, and so I'm going to transition. And so like all the stuff, like I'll use a lot of pocket holes, you know, people are like, ah, pocket holes. And, uh, I just think that that whole argument is ridiculous, but, uh, because the barrier to entry is so low yeah, and yeah, I yeah. find that if you can show somebody how to make a piece of furniture 
and that they can do it and it's attainable and achievable. They can go get a pocket hole jig for, I mean, as cheap as 20 bucks and some lumber from the, from, you know, the home center. And then they throw together uh, a project and they're going to look back at it later and go, oh man, that was really a piece of junk, but, but they've done it. And then they get that bug and they're like, wow, I can make something. And then you start, you know, you start moving along. So that's what I like to do with a lot of my stuff um, when it's furniture is that I'll have like the base will be made out of, let's say pocket hole, something that's easier. And then the top I'll use, I'll use walnut tops for a lot yeah. of my stuff. And then so showing people like, Hey, here's how you can use a planer. Here's how you can use a joiner, you know, use the bandsaw. So I use a lot of different tools more just to pique people's interest and show them, you know, what else is out there. And so I kind of, you know, consider myself a, a transition. So it's yeah. like, okay, you've made that first project out of two by fours. Now come over here. Let me show you what else you can do. Uh, and then, you know, you can, you can keep progressing. Yeah. That next step. I was talking with uh, Ben Ueda with Homemade Modern last week. He's got a future episode when this actually comes out. And uh, yeah, he was just talking about like, man, I just got like Ryobi, like I've got a, like a, a uh, circular saw and a drill oh, yeah. and like I'm making this this stuff so it's, it's crazy that you can do that and he was super focused um on that too now I know you've got a big background in analytics uh so you did you were six 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 sigma uh GEAE uh which the first time I saw that uh it was on someone's desk and I'm like oh cool like they're like martial arts like they're doing all this kind of <laughs> stuff for for those that may not know like how did analytics enter your story and how I'm kind of I want to pull that back to woodworking you mentioned focusing on that like how did you decide that was kind of the niche you wanted to go after that transition niche on the analytics side uh yeah so it's funny uh, like you know being in you know, engineering or process improvement, like I'll say, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a black belt. And then I became a, a master black belt. Like, but then if I just go tell some, somebody off the street, I'm like, yeah, I'm a master black belt. They're like, whoa, seriously? Dude? Like, <laughs> yeah, show me like a roundhouse or something. I'm like, no, that's like a nerd ninja. Not, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> not, yeah. A, not a real ninja. Um, <laughs> so, so yes, I have a certifications there and, uh, you know, kind of the same thing, I guess a, a constant thing with me through my life. And I've talked about this. I think I talked about this with Donnie over on uh, the green woodworker podcast. Um, well, shout out to Donnie, um, uh, is, is that I've always, I'm very achievement oriented. And so I always like to go after the next thing, whether it's the certification or, or, you know, a degree or, or whatever, or, you know, this YouTube thing or doing a business. And I think as I started figuring out and, uh, so at GE, Six Sigma, which is their analytical arm of of evaluating processes and process control, um, that that was like a very revered thing at at GE is to you know the the Six Sigma program, and so you become a green belt and then a black belt and then a master black belt. So I started it there, then I I continued it when I went to my next employer, and again, uh, I guess I've I've got my master black belt there when I was at Kroger, um, and so you know part of it was again I was just good at it, and so it clicked, and I enjoyed the the analytics. And then the other part of it was that man, I, like I want this thing, I want to get the certification, uh, I want to just continue to learn and understand these tools so I can help other people because that's you know that's what you do when you are uh, Six Sigma. You go in, you evaluate processes, and you figure out where there's opportunity, where there's uh, errors. And you can use that and make the process better and help people out. So that kind of really resonated, like those two things. And I hadn't really figured it out then, but you know, I, I really have a passion for helping people and for teaching people. Yeah. And and I think that was was kind of coming up through that analytical piece of doing the Six Sigma, because again, like I said, you're you're you become a subject matter expert, and so you're typically helping other teams, other departments. Um, and, and so I think that was just kind of a, a normal progression that I didn't quite see at the time. So then when you, when you say, okay, transition and, and what does that look like that, uh, you know, into woodworking and that, that I think the teaching aspect of that, because you learn a lot. So I was, I used to teach classes. Mm. Um, I would lead classes on six Sigma. So I would teach our green belts and I would mentor black belts. And again, I, th I think that I just, I realized, oh man, I really like, I really like teaching people and I really yeah. like having an impact and being able to show somebody something new. Yeah, that's cool. All right. So, uh, did I see that you launched fix that, fix this, build that the actual website? Was that in 2013? Is that right? Uh, 2015. 2015. So I did, yeah. March of 2015. I launched, uh, my Instagram, Instagram okay. in 2013. When you first started that account, did you, were you like, this is going to be like a side hustle. This is going to be something I kind of mess around with, or were you like, Hey, this is something that could potentially like turn into what it's, what it's now. Like what, what was your kind of initial thought process back then? Uh, I think, 
so when I got onto Instagram, um, I had a, a friend and it was actually, um, a, a coworker of mine from Kroger that I had met. And, and then since, you know, I had moved down here, um, and I think, so we moved down here in 2013 of, uh, we moved down to Nashville in August of 2013. I grew up here. So we kind of moved back home, um, August of 2013, moved down here and I actually had taken the job down here in February. So that was really crappy six months of my life, oh, no, um, yeah. being away from my wife and kids and, yeah. and just traveling. But anyway, I uh, came out here. So, so, but I think one of the things I was doing is I was spending more time, you know, like on the internet and, you know, just kind of social media and starting to figure out what that was. Um, and my friend, um, had a fitness account on Instagram and she had like 50,000 followers. And I was like, what in the world is this? Like, yeah. this is crazy. And I, and I didn't really understand what Instagram was at the moment. Uh, I thought Instagram was like a photo editing app, yeah. like a, like a VSCO. Yeah. And so, um, I was like, and, and she's hilarious. She's awesome girl. Uh, and so, uh, I was like, man, like I want to do this. I want to like share my woodworking. And so that's when I decided like, Hey, I'm going to start this. Um, or actually, no, I, I take that back. I guess I had, I had started my account under a personal name and that's when I was in November. I was like, okay, fix this, build that. And my wife, uh, came up with a name. We were like brainstorming together. So we're sitting there and the idea I think was like, Hey, this could be, it, it was honestly, it was looking at her and being like, oh, wow, she has all these followers. Like, like that's doable. I could do that. Now I didn't, the, the thought process wasn't like, I wasn't thinking about YouTube at all. I was literally just thinking about Instagram. Um, so it wasn't this grand scheme. And again, like a lot of things in my life, I think there have just been iteration. Yeah. And so as I did that and I launched it, uh, as I started getting a foothold and I started trying to put more information out there back and that was back in the stone ages of Instagram. You know, I think they had eight second video, uh, maybe it was, they went up to 15 seconds at one point, you know, no carousel, no yeah. stories. So it was hard to tell a story. It's hard to get across what you want to get across. Uh, and people started asking for more. They're like, man, I, like, how did you make that? Cause I'd be sharing the projects I was building. And my wife was like, you really need to do a blog. And so that's when, uh, in March of 2015, I finally did it. But so I did have some foresight at the very beginning in, in 2013, I registered the don domain name. I got all the handles. I got the YouTube channel. Uh, so if you go back and like look at my YouTube history, it'll be like started in 2013, but you know, I didn't put my first video out until like 2016. So uh, I, I was kind of prepared for it in the beginning. So yeah, I did. I did think like, oh, this could be cool. And like, I wanted to lock everything down. But when I started in 2013, I wasn't like, oh yeah, I'm going full time, baby. Like it was just like, hey, this would be cool uh, it, because I didn't even realize from a monetary perspective what was even possible back then? Like, I had no idea. Um, now, I know, I mean, if for those that are listening that don't know it, uh, make sure and check your guys' podcasts, uh, Made for Profit, uh, especially all the numbers and the money and that side of things for folks that want to side hustle. But when you were first starting, do you remember the first time like someone approached you? Like, hey, could you sponsor this? Or could you, like, when, did, when was that even, did it click with you? It's like, oh, this can actually, this, it works like this. Yeah. And that was, um, I want to say that was in 2014. Uh, and I don't remember what milestone it was. Um, I'd have to go back and check, but it wasn't anything huge. It was maybe 1500, maybe 5,000 followers, 4,000, I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Um, but I had, I had, uh, I had built a flip top, the flip top tool cart, if you've seen that. Um, and, uh, this was like the second iteration of it. So the first one I built back in Cincinnati, this was the second iteration. And uh, I had a rigid planer on one side and a rigid oscillating spindle center on the other. And I posted it. And uh, the rigid Instagram account, they reached out to me and they're like, man, that is awesome. Like, uh, hey, can we send you? So it was they're actually their new compressor. Um, they're like, hey, can we send you your new com the new compressor for you to check out? I was like, yeah, absolutely. Like, it wasn't like, hey, sponsor or anything. Gotcha. They were just like, hey, we, we're going to send it to you. Can you review it? Because it was a new product. And, you know, companies will do that sometimes um, to get feedback. And they liked what I was doing. And so I got it. And I was like, oh, thank you. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, they just sent me a free compressor. <laughs> this is amazing. And so I was like, I was like, OK. And then I was like, OK, I'm going to I'm going to push my limits here. And so, like, I got it and I like wrote a review and I was like, you know, it was really cool. And I was like, hey, thank you guys so much. I was like, by the way, would you be interested in sponsoring a giveaway? Because uh, like back then, you know, this was this is like 2014, right? So this yeah. was a long time. Giveaways were just kind of getting started and they weren't as huge as they are. And and not many people were sponsoring them um, back then. I mean, there weren't even that many companies on Instagram mm -hmm. back then. So they were like, 
yeah, how about what if we got gave you a drill and a driver kit? And it was like they're, you know, kind of a base model drill driver kit. And I was like, that would be amazing. And so that was the beginning of, um, you know, that was the first time where I where they said, hey, like, yeah, well, we will give this to you now. You know, I didn't make any money off it. I actually had, you know, I had to pay shipping because right. they shipped it to me and then yeah. I shipped it out. But I realized, OK, companies, you know, there's companies out there that are looking uh, you know, for exposure and to get their product in people's hands. So that was like the first time I realized like, oh, wow. Uh, and then the first sponsored post I did, I did a blog post on some pallet crates and I remember, it, so it was 200 bucks. And I was like, oh yes, 200 bucks, yeah. baby, I've arrived. Yeah. Uh, and I built a, uh, I built like, it was for uh, a company called Pallets and Crate or Crate and, Crate and Pallets. Uh, and I built an organizing system for my closet. Actually, I did a remake of it and did a YouTube video. Yeah, on it. I remember so, that. One. That was just what, just uh, like three months ago, ish. Yeah, that okay. wasn't. Yeah, exactly. But the original one was was way back in um, in uh, September of 2015. So so yeah, that was uh, you know it's kind of a journey to get there. So it's like yeah, I, I first realized it in 14, and then it really didn't start clicking until the end of 15, and then the beginning of 16 is when things really started rolling for me. Gotcha, yeah, yeah. So switching over to YouTube, uh, you started your account about a year ago, is that right? From, we're recording August 2017? Or not, October yeah, 2017, I, sorry. I, yeah, I launched, uh, it's, it's been you know almost a year and a half. Year I think half, I launched okay. my first video in June, May or June. Um, I had some other ones beforehand, like, like I mentioned, I had, <laughs> they've since been removed. Okay, yeah. Like, if, if you want to know how to put insulation in your garage door and you want really, really, really bad video. Yeah. You know, I think I think I've actually got it like uh, private or unlisted. Yeah, I could give you a URL and you'd be like, whoa, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's what I was, was going to ask, because sometimes when I'm talking with folks like I'll just reverse search them on YouTube to see their first video. And like, I mean, yours was I mean, that's the flip top uh, tool and everyone still builds it. I mean, it's an incredible video. Uh, did you. Or do you even now struggle with like, because I mean, it came out great quality. Do you struggle now with like, I, I need to put a video out, but I'm not sure if this is the best quality. I don't know, but the mistakes, all that kind of stuff. Like, how does, yeah. how does that work? The, and and yeah, so thank you for that. But it's not that great quality or anything. <laughs> I thought the video was actually okay. The audio was, was atrocious. Oh, yeah. Um, because, yeah, I was like, I was using my onboard camera, oh, my, okay. you know, in my echoey garage. And I was just like, oh, um, but I've been, and I, I've talked about this in in you know, other podcasts and stuff, but I won't go through the whole story. But basically, um, the reason why it took me so long to start is because I'm I'm a perfectionist, and so I didn't start on my cell phone. Um, I wanted to make sure I had a product that I was really comfortable with yeah. to the point that I would not, I would never recommend that to people. I'd recommend them just to go ahead and get started. And so my first videos were probably a lot better than uh, they needed to be. Uh, so like from a video call, like I, my first videos I shot on a DSLR. Yeah. So like that was, I started straight away. Um, but yeah, going back now and looking at, you know, so audio quality was probably the biggest thing for me and then looking at the edits and starting to figure out. So yeah, I, I do still, there are times when I shoot stuff and I'm like, oh man, I didn't quite get that right. Uh, but I put a lot of detail in my, in my videos. Um, and so, and I've started to, you know, as I go through and, and I, I don't know, I think my video counts up to 30, but I don't think I've done that. I, it's up to 30, but I think there's a couple in there that are, you know, some giveaway or a Patreon or something or an unlisted. Uh, but anyway, regardless, I, I've really kind of honed in. And so at this point, it's more like, um, you know, if I leave something in the shot that I'm like, oh, geez, there's like, you know, a, a, the, the trash can with junk flown out of it or whatever it is, like something like that. And, um, you know, I'm just I'm getting down the voiceover and that kind of stuff. So I'm pretty heavy voiceover and uh, you know, starting to get the process down on that. So, you know, these days it's more just like nits and nats versus anything. But yeah, yeah. at the beginning, the audio quality was really bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I was looking at your analytics a little bit earlier from uh, Social Blade, I guess. I don't know how yep. accurate those are, but there seems pretty like accurate. there was like an inflection point, especially on YouTube around like February of this year. It's like it was going, then all of a sudden it started like going up. Like what was going on then? And like, what was that ride kind of like, or has, has it been like? Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's the one thing that we talk about a lot on made for profit, but, um, you know, YouTube is very unlike, uh, a lot of other social media platforms in the sense that, um, 
things can blow up and you really don't know why. Yeah. And it's not necessarily when. So that what you're specifically talking about was interesting because it was not a video I put out huh. uh, then. It was a video. It was my cutting board video uh, okay. that I put out in January. Huh. And so it took it, it did fairly well going straight off. And then like it, it kind of lulled. And then like a month, maybe 30, 45 days out, 30 to 60 days, I'll say. I don't remember exactly what it was. All of a sudden it just took off. And so what happens if if you study in the YouTube algorithm, what happens is that they will test, um, they'll put stuff on the home page or the home feed, not necessarily like the full home page, but um, they will basically just put your videos into people's feeds. And if it resonates well, then they'll put it into more people's feeds. And so it's just kind of like a snowball. Yeah. Um, and so apparently they did that, um, you know, well after the video would have basically been in kind of steady state, you know, it had the initial uh, large bump and then it had come down. And it just took off. And I was just like looking, I'm like, holy cow, what, like, what is going on? And it just took off and it just kept going and going. Um, and then I think at the same time, uh, a modern outdoor sofa table, or not sofa table, modern outdoor sofa uh, was doing kind of a similar thing. So I had two videos that just took off. Gotcha. And and those are, the cutting board is my biggest video. I think it's over 400,000 views right now. Um, and then I think actually the sofa just past 400,000 views as well. So those went and it was, it's really cool just to watch it. But the, the bad part about it is that same thing is like, you have no control over it. Like I'm, I yeah. wasn't pushing it. I wasn't pushing it. I wasn't doing anything to make it happen. And so that's really cool. But at the same time, it's like really, it just makes you feel kind of helpless. Cause it's like, well, if I'm not doing anything to make it there, then I can't continue to do anything yeah. to keep it there. Right. And so, um, you know, you just watch it and then eventually it kind of came back down. Uh, but it's weird. Yeah. It'll, it'll spike up every, you know, 60 or 90 days. It'll hit, it'll hit a huge spike. Um, and I know I, I do some Pinterest traffic and stuff like that. So some of that will drive it. Like if somebody repins it, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's really fun to watch it, to watch a video go. Uh, but it's kind of odd when it happens, you know, two months after you published it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cause on the flip side of your Instagram growth is like pretty consistent, like from like, yes. this is a, a line just going straight up. Uh, the whole way. Yeah. Right? So, yeah and that one is very crazy. consistent. So Instagram, like I've got Instagram down to like, where if, if I post something, I can look and I know in the first hour, whether it's going to do really well or not. And I know how that's going to translate into subscribers. Um, and I've got, you know, my whole spreadsheet, yeah. if you've listened to made for profit, I can see. So like that one is very predictable. Yeah. Uh, and like, you know, like something it like it never pops up like, you know, a video that I posted and videos do really well on Instagram. Uh, but a video or a picture I posted even you know, 14 days ago is never going to generate me, you know, any kind of subscribers, uh, in today's world or in tomorrow's world. Yeah. Um, it's all in the moment. So, you know, that I like Instagram for that because you know, it's, it's a lot easier to predict. Yeah. That's cool. That's real cool. Uh, so the last kind of few questions as we're wrapping up, definitely wanted to ask, I know, so you've gone full-time this year, August of 2017. What, yep. what was that? conversation like like especially like with your wife i mean you have a great full-time job um what was that that like in that process for you yeah so i think it was you know back to your earlier question about did i have it in mind when i when i started the instagram um i didn't but very quickly i think you know there were there was that it, it turned into like a, a dream of yeah. like oh man this would be cool but it was still like far out. And like I, like I mentioned, I didn't, you know, until the end of 2015 where I made 200 bucks on a post. I mean, it's like, so clearly, <laughs> you know, being, being an, an engineer with, uh, you know, 17 at that point, you know, 15 years on the job, um, you don't translate that to, Oh, I could actually make this into a full-time job. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it had to grow. So as it started growing, I, th I think once it started growing and once I started getting, uh, paid sponsorships that, it started becoming a conversation. Uh, so it, you know, it became just from paying for my tools or paying for supplies to like, Oh, cool. Like we've got some extra money we could do something with, or we could put it towards, uh, you know, a house payment or car payment or whatever. Um, that my wife and I just started having this ongoing conversation yeah. and it was, um, it just started becoming like, Oh, this is cool. And then it, as it kept growing, we're like, wow, like this is, this is starting to add up. And yeah. as I started getting, I started getting into plan sales. Uh, I started, so I started getting all these different revenue streams that were just stacking up and I like to call it, you know, lots of uh, drops and lots of different buckets. So you, you collect all the buckets together and you collect all the rainwater, then you dump them in the one big, big bucket. And you're like, holy cow, like I, this is, this is a lot of water. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. And when it all adds up together. So as it started adding up, uh, we started having that conversation and it started becoming a bigger thing. And it was like, well, could we actually do this? Yeah, I think we could do this. 
Uh, like I, I still need to grow. And then seeing people who are who are doing it. Uh, I mean, that was a huge thing. Right. So, you know, seeing, you know, Mark Spagnolo and Bob Claggett and these guys who were in full time jobs that then quit them uh, and, and went off. And especially in, in their specific, specifically for those guys, because they're more, you know, more in tech fields and, yeah. and a little bit more relatable um, was that. Yeah. This all of a sudden became like, OK, I think we could do this. Like we need to grow. And uh, my youngest. So the inflection point for us was always that uh, to get the kids out of school or get the kids in school because my wife was a stay at home mom. Gotcha. My youngest just started kindergarten this year. Oh, okay. Uh, and so it was all like we had this this date on the calendar for about two years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so as like it was like, OK, August of 2017, um, as we you know, it's first a dream, then it started becoming reality. And then my wife is a teacher. She has gone back to work. And so we do have the the full time income and my wife is super, super supportive. Yeah. Uh, and so she was like, yes, absolutely. Like, like we can do this. Uh, so, you know, we get insurance through her, we get a steady paycheck and then we've got my stuff on the side and we're adding it up and, and, um, you know, we got rid of our debt. And so that was a huge piece of it too. Yeah. And yeah, it was just, I mean, she's totally on board because cool. she knows how passionate I am about it. And she saw how, how much I was running myself into the ground working the full-time job and then doing all of that stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, until, until August, I was doing it all at night and yeah. on the weekends. And so now like the, just the work-life balance is just amazing right now. It's, it's fantastic. That's real cool. Uh, well, the, the last two questions, uh, we like to ask everyone that comes on, uh, so it's make or break show. And so, uh, on the make side of things, do you, and I'm sure you've answered this before, but is there a project looking back that was your favorite? It doesn't have to be like a YouTube build, but like the actual project itself that you're like the most proud of. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm still going with, uh, my DIY sideboard. So that's what, okay. what I typically tell people, but although the nightstand, that modern end table, uh, that that's coming up quickly just because it's so, oh man, the wood on that is so nice. But uh, I did this DIY sideboard, which is, um, it was like a, a, a poplar base and, you know, just two drawers down below two uh, two doors and then two drawers. And then it has this really nice uh, kind of reclaimed rustic walnut top. And I did do a video on it out there. Um, the video didn't perform that great, uh, but it just had a lot of skills in it. So uh, I was building, uh, you know, frame and panel doors. Uh, I turned the knobs and the pulls on my lathe. Yeah. yeah. So, so I used these walnut pulls, which tie into the walnut top. Um, and so it was just like, it, it was just like a lot, a, a lot of stuff to go together. And I got to use a lot of different skills and I just love the way it looks and it, you know, it's sitting in our dining room right now. So, uh, that's probably my favorite one. That's cool. All right. So then on the break side of things, is there, whether a mistake or something that really stands out, but it, was it, is there like a lesson that you remember learning? Like, do you have one of those like big moments looking back? I don't call it a, uh, necessarily a big learning moment other than like, ah, why are you such an idiot? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, one of my more recent builds, uh, the base cabinet. So I did, made some base cabinets for my shop Yeah, and, and I actually include this in the video and I got, I got really great feedback, uh, about including the mistake because I think it's really important to show people, uh, a, that you're human and, and B just to like show them, Hey, don't do this. Yeah. Uh, and so when I made, it was, uh, doors on the outside. So it was three bays, doors on the outside and a, a bank of drawers in the middle. But I had pullout trays for the doors and I used Euro hinges. So it was a frameless cabinet. And and actually, John Malecki was like, dude, make sure you shim out those uh, those drawers. And I was like, oh, yeah, I got it. Make sure they clear the hinges. Well, I I thought I had done it. Uh -huh. But what I did was I I, I made drawers uh, pull out trays and they were clear of the hinges what I didn't realize is that the door doesn't actually clear. So when I assembled and I put the doors on, uh, if you pulled the tray out, it would run into the door. Oh, no. <laughs> so, like even with the door fully wide open. Yeah. Of just the way the hinge works. And so I was just like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. So uh, then I was like, oh, I'll just throw them on the table saw and cut them down and then shim it out. But I had put brad nails in the outsides mm -hmm. of those trays to, to hold them. Uh, and so I couldn't cut it because it was too close to the outside of the tray. Uh, so basically I had to tear that down and then shim it out. Uh, so yeah, that was one I was just like, ah, oh, man, because I'm pretty, I'm pretty meticulous, right? Because yeah. I do the whole, you know, SketchUp drawing and everything, obviously being in mechanical engineering, um, I love SketchUp and, uh, so I had modeled everything out and I just had it all down. And then it's just that, you know, you put that door on and I'm like all happy and I go to pull the tray and it just smacks into the door and I'm <laughs> like, 
Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's real good. So uh, fixthisbuildthat.com, is that the best place you'd send folks for, for everything you're doing? Yep, that's the hub for everything. And uh, they can get to social media. They can get to uh, the pod. I think they, I hope they can get to the podcast there. Yeah, made for, but, yeah. Made for profit though. This is the podcast. Yeah, madeforprofit.com uh, is the podcast with John and myself. Uh, we're really enjoying that. And then obviously I spend a ton of time, uh, on Instagram. Yeah. And it's your, your nine o'clock Sunday live. Is that right? Nine o'clock. You got it. Yeah. Nine nine o'clock PM Sunday night, uh, do a live. Uh, it's, it's really awesome. Get, uh, get a bunch of folks on there. We just have a good time for about an hour hanging out. That's cool. Um, usually cracking a cold one and just talking about the week and whatever comes up. <laughs> That's sweet. Well, but I appreciate your time. It was a, it was a blast talking and just to hear your journey is, is awesome. So yeah, thanks for having me, Brandon. Yeah. Yeah.